everyone, welcome into Attacking Third, brought to you by PNC Bank, brilliantly boring since 1865. Alongside Darian Jenkins and Christine Kupo, I'm Lisa Carlin. We have a lot to get to today with news. We're talking UEFA Women's European Qualifiers. NWSL is also back this weekend. But ladies, we are coming off of an international break. And we watch a lot of football for fun, for work, but we saw a lot of good matches over this last week. Which international team did you like watching for fun. Which one did you have fun watching, Darian? Oh, I'm going to go with the Lionesses. Ooh, I, I like think that. that turnaround from the first leg was really fun to watch. Lauren Hemp was on fire. Mm. Uh, the French had them in the first leg. It was just, it was a really good matchup between two powerhouses in European soccer. That was mine. What about you, Christine? I, for fun, I mean, honestly, the U.S. Yeah, I, I really, it, it was inspiring. It, it's nice to get that like mm -hmm. enjoyment out of it again, mm -hmm. aside from yeah. just like watching where you're like, oh, there's so much happening here. Not to mention just like the smiling across the faces of the players is Raving kind of contagious. Enjoys. Right. Yes. Like you don't see that very often. And it's like they're loving this, mm -hmm. but like also the relationships between each other just like gives me a boost. Hands down. That's mine, too. I was so much fun watching the U.S. in these two matches against South Korea and the joy that they had, the joy that Emma Hayes brought on the sideline mm -hmm. and the players. And they just looked so fun and free and it was entertaining. I don't know. That makes it fun for me as well. <laughs> and it's like great football. They're scoring goals. They're having fun. Uh, let's jump into the news because we have some big news coming out of Spain because Spanish world champion forward Mariona Caldente is leaving Barcelona. This comes after a decade representing Barcelona. She's decided she's going to take on a new professional challenge following the end of her contract, which comes at the end of June. Through 302 matches, Caldente scored 114 goals. She won three Champions League, six league trophies, and of course, the Women's World Cup for Spain. According to reports, Caldente is expected to join Arsenal as a free transfer. And this comes at a pretty good time, Christine. Arsenal is leaving or is going to be without forward Viv Miedema, and they're potentially bringing in Caldente. Is this an even trade? I don't know that it's an even trade. It's an interesting trade. It will definitely be a valuable trade for sure. Mm -hmm. I think it's very hard to say a one-on-one -on -one between Viv Miedema, who's all-time WSL top goal scorer, and then someone who's as talented as Caldente, who just – different qualities, right, as players. If Miedema can play as a 9 or a 10, more natural in the 10 role, um, significant contributions, whereas Caldente, again, like playmaker, can just about do anything with the ball, um, long-range shots, the power that she has, just the intelligence, but also left winger, left mid prim mm -hmm. primarily in her career. So to see how Arsenal would slot her, I'm curious whose job might be up for grabs in sort of this recycle, yeah. reshuffle. When one comes in, one must mm -hmm. always league. But to have Caldente in Super League? Like, Champagne uh, problems. Scary. And also something yeah. that Arsenal dealt with was a lot of injuries this last year. So having Caldente there, who I think she can slot in at the 10. I think having a Spanish player slot into that position with a bunch of English players mm -hmm. and how diverse that team is would be key for little this next sauce. year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a little a little sauce. No rumors as there. for now as to where Caldente is going. Of course, we'll keep you all updated when we do have actual reports of where Mariona Caldente goes. But out of FIFA, there has been some big world news because FIFA is incorporating new regulations about working conditions for professional women's footballers. FIFA Pro, the women, or the World Players Union, um, have updated their labor condition regulations. Uh, some of that being a minimum of two, four or eight weeks leave for adoption, at least eight weeks of leave for partners of mothers in same-sex relationships, granting them the right to take time off for health issues related to menstruation. And they've also added a new clause encouraging a family-friendly environment at the Federation level for players with children. It seems like it's a step in the right direction to make new mothers comfortable in football and not push them to the side to have to choose between being a footballer and, and being a mother. It's mm -hmm. a step in the right direction, Darian. It's massive, uh, and I'm totally here for it. I mean, I want these rights over here. Like, what <laughs> like, are we this doing? This is very progressive. Where do I sign? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, this it's incredible, and I'm happy for these players that they're getting these rights. I know there's still a lot to push for, mm -hmm. um, 100%, but this is a really good start, and it's good to see that there's progressive movement for FIFA Pro because it's been a really, really long time coming where players for so long have had to choose right mm -hmm. between – being a mother, starting a family, and your entire playing career, what you've dreamed of since being a little girl and wanting to go play soccer. Um, and same for men that want to choose, that are choosing to adopt. So 
I, I love it. I'm here for it. I can't wait to see the next steps and the next progressions of this. There I think are, that's an important detail, yes. though, too, in that is that it acknowledges that families look differently, that yep. there isn't just one exactly. nuclear family. And I feel like extending these benefits mm -hmm. to both maternity and paternity leave is really, really important to just modern day community. Yeah, this was one step forward and FIFRO is hoping to take another step forward because there are more rules that they are still advocating for. Some of them being players whose contracts expires while they're on maternity leave or during pregnancy, that their contract extends at least until the next international break. So they have time to do those negotiations as well as extending family and adoption leaves to five fathers and recognizing that um, they should not overlook the fact that both fathers and mothers should be spending time mm -hmm. with their children. So steps in the right direction all across the world for FIFPRO and FIFA to make these uh, adjustments. Uh, but there is some other news coming out of European football that it isn't so great for women's football, specifically in France and Germany, as women's teams are being forced to take steps back due to financial issues, specifically in Germany, Duisburg. The men's team was relegated to the fourth tier and the women's team was regularly Related to the second tier and in an attempt to cut costs the club announced that it is withdrawing its women's team from the second Bundesliga stating that the club can't afford it they're saying that they're unable to find sponsors and funding for the women's team however they will still continue the women's grassroots program meanwhile in France Orléans is in the midst of an ownership change so the club is also facing financial difficulty the second division women's team and a third division's men team but the president of the club saying that they're announcing budget cuts meaning that they're not eligible to compete in second division any longer. The players did protest in their last match versus Strasbourg, covering the logo, covering their mouse, and also not playing a moment of silence. Um, the federation is working with the team to see what they can do, not play in the second in the second division, but maybe play in the third division. It, this has been a longstanding fight and battle for equality in women's football around the world, Darian. And at times it feels like two steps forward, one steps back. It goes so deep. I'd even say three steps back at times. Uh, it goes so deep into the system of your platform, your professional career, the assets you get being a professional player are contingent upon how the men are doing. I experienced that at Bordeaux. Sadly, when I left, the men got relegated to Ligue 2 and the women caught, there was a ton of funding that got cut from the women and they're no longer competing for Champions League. So sadly, this happens so often in women's soccer and there needs to be that separation where it's not contingent on how the men are and it doesn't go so deep into the system. We can't obviously cover all of that in this segment on E3 right now, but it goes very, very deep. There needs to be a lot of different moves to make this so that the women have a secure place when they are performing well, that they know that it's going to be progressive and that they still have professional jobs and a professional platform to perform. In France, uh, the Federation is still working with Orléans to see if they can play and compete in a, a lower division. Uh, that's it for our new segment, but we have plenty more to get through. Welcome back to Attacking Third. After four match days in the Women's Euros qualifiers, only three teams have already qualified, a few of them remaining perfect. Germany and Spain going 4-0 and throughout their first four match days. Switzerland, despite falling 1-0 to Hungary on Tuesday, they pick up three wins and have automatically qualified as host. The way the standings work in each group, the top two teams in each league book their tickets to the Euros and the third and fourth place team advance to the playoffs. No team is eliminated from uh, this league at this point in the qualifiers. But so far, Germany and Spain have just run away with it. In terms of the points and the wins that they've picked up, what has been impressive about Spain? Spain is Spain. Yeah, now, they, they know what they're doing. They're very well organized. Um, they love to score goals. Um, really attractive style of play. Uh, I think with this last Denmark game, it was sort of this weird anomaly that I think they forgot there was a whole first half of game to play because mm -hmm. they really just turned on in the second half. Um, they had nearly 20 shots that they managed to get off, managed to dominate in ball possession, but Denmark ended up being more clinical, mm -hmm. and then they lost it. You know, Thompson can only do so much. He managed to brace in that game. Beyond that, Spain took control, and mm -hmm. it was a wrap. But, a little bit of a, a breather then for yeah. Spain, knowing that heading into the next... <laughs> an exciting game, too. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, for Germany, they are also the other team that has qualified outside of Switzerland as the host because uh, Germany, are they Germany, too? If we're going with Spain to Spain, is Germany Germany? <laughs> <laughs> the Germans are Germany in the Germany. Germans. Germany. Uh, no, they, they look good in the second half of mm -hmm. matches. They're starting out pretty weak. They're, my opinion, watching the last two matches, they look like they're so 
out of sorts in the attack. Mm. Nobody has a real style or execution of what they're trying to do. As soon as you take Oberdorf and Pop out of the mix, there's not much for them to go off of. The crosses into the box weren't great. The final passes weren't great. Once they started to get set pieces and were able to, unfortunately, pull and got an own goal, the tide started to turn. Then yeah. they started to look dangerous and lethal and get into the 18 with actual constructive stringing together passes and pulling Poland apart. But they don't look like the German squad we're used to seeing until late in the match. Going into the next phase of this, they need to start games out how they start in the second half. You can't wait until the second 45 minutes to hopefully claw your way back. We've seen the same thing with Spain because teams exactly. are going to punish you. They're going to make those adjustments. Um, but I hope they take some learning points from this last matchup because I, I saw a lot from them. Pressure definitely off for Spain and Germany, knowing that they have already qualified. Meanwhile, for some of the other groups, including Group A1, pressure is fully on because it was a match day full of draws when we take a look at the Group A1 standings. Um, despite uh, an early lead by Italy just six minutes into their match, um, ultimately Norway came back and they end up drawing. Netherlands, they sit atop of this group with seven points after their 1-1 draw with Finland. And because Norway and Italy tied on five points, it's goal differential that lifts Norway to second place. Let's chat a little Italy-Norway. This match ending in a 1-1 draw and six minutes in, Italy had a lead thanks to Manuela Giuliano. Norway, they fought back. 81st minute, Arsenal midfielder Frida Manuel, she gets a goal in this one. Um, Christine, for Italy, where did it fall apart? Uh, it fell apart whereby they decided to control and dominate the majority of the game, but do little to nothing with it. Um, they had six corners in this match, unable to convert. They do not really have someone capable of winning aerial duels on this squad. And you saw it. It was evident. Um, just some, even when they would build up and they'd have some really nicely strung together passes, it's like it, it would go left, it would go post, it would go anywhere other than in the goal. Mm -hmm. um, just haven't been particularly good at scoring anything beyond maybe two goals per game. Um, but they have managed to keep their lossless streak alive with this uh, match at home, at least. Exactly. Uh, which is promising, but you know, you never want to ride it this closely where you're worrying if it's coming down to goal differential, whether or not you're sticking the course, especially when you have season vets so Bononcea, Girelli and Linari both 100 cap club this was exactly. that match that they got uh, awarded their trophies so um, hopefully they managed to reorganize and get it together yeah a lot still to play for in this group though with uh, Norway as well getting this draw they needed points in this match but ultimately in the standings within this group everyone is in no one is out at this point which just makes it that much more uh, gut-wrenching essentially Norway they can qualify for the Euros uh, with a win uh, in Finland on July 12th and when we look at the overall group Darian who do you think makes it through who gets the top two spots in this group I think Norway, Netherlands. Yeah? I do. I do. Kupo? I like that. <sighs> Italy's currently like, <laughs> Italy's only in third on goal differential. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go Netherlands, Italy. Can I do that? Norway, Italy? Italy's yeah. got to be in the top two. I don't care. <laughs> I like it. I, I'm going to go Netherlands, Italy as well. I think Italy's going to be able to get it done. They're, they're only in third on goal differential, and then they play the Netherlands, yeah. and then they play Finland. Finland. There's a lot, a lot still on the line here know. in this Group A1. Plenty to play for. We'll see. Um, let's take a look at the Group A2 standings because this group with Spain at the tippy top, remaining undefeated with four wins and 12 points. Denmark, they pick up their second loss and they stay behind of Belgium, or excuse me, uh, Belgium picking up their second loss. They stay behind Denmark in third place, six points for Denmark. Uh, we talked a little bit about Spain already in their match. They come from behind, win 3-2 against Denmark after Denmark taking a two-goal lead. Um, Spain ultimately rallies and they come back to win it. It, it was nerve-wracking to watch that match, Christine. You talked about it. But when we look at this group, Spain has already qualified. Only one more group can qualify in the next international break with two match days remaining. Who does it, Christine? Who gets through? Denmark. Ooh. I agree. I think Denmark's going through. Why? I think that they're just the more solid team than Belgium. I mean, they check. look sharper. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, you're out. Uh, I, I like in it. my opinion, I think Denmark 
Well, Belgium and Denmark, they will play in that first match day back on July 12th, so we'll see plenty to come in that Group A2 standings. Let's take a look at Group A3 standings, uh, potentially the group of death, in my opinion. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, Sweden, they get the win 1-0 over Ireland, and England's 2-1 win over France um, puts the Lionesses equal on points with Sweden, but goal differential, that's what it comes down to. The Lionesses are in third place. Ireland, in this group, they are officially relegated to League B after losing all four of their qualifying matches so far, but they're not out. They still move on to the playoffs for these qualifiers. England, France, we have to talk about this second match because it was a complete turnaround. England lose the first match against France 2-1. Um, they end up coming out swinging and they looked like a new side ultimately Darian, they get the 2-1 win over France. What was different in the second meeting? They were reinvigorated and France sadly looked so out of sorts. They couldn't handle the pressure. Russo hold up play, Hemp laying it off this brilliant finish from Stan way as soon as this happened France started turning against each other the body language was bad in the audio you could hear Jose Renard shouting at the players oh we go we go we go and there just wasn't anything it looked so disconnected they tried to high press but England was really taking advantage of France's left side over the top of Basha and Karchawi their ability to go high is a huge asset in France's attack defensively it left them really vulnerable you saw England keep capitalizing on that long ball, that big switch, and Mead, Hemp, whoever was over on that side, Chloe Kelly, were able to really get on the end of those and cause some huge issues to France, and they were just having to defend. And as we say, defending sucks, and the more you have to do it and you don't get to enjoy the ball, the more frustrated you get, and then there's no result in the attack for them. So I think this was a really good turnaround for England. Uh, a little frustrating for France that they let it get out of control because they won the first match. They came into this, I think, with good energy energy, but I don't know. Hopefully this is a good good warm up for them going into the Olympics mm -hmm. and maybe the next stages of the group, but it, it was a tough loss if you were French. It was a little bit frustrating. I, France started out really strong. The high press shook things up yeah. a little bit, and then England just regained their composure and just exploited every bit of space that they could. And it was interesting because the lineup changed 0% mm -hmm. over the last match. Georgia Stanway had an excellent performance. The back CB pairing that we questioned the last go around, all of a sudden way more solid. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the pep talk was in between games, or maybe it's just thinking that they got bounced at a Nations League. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. They, on top of that, they lost their Olympics chance. Like, maybe what it was is just like we need a, a little bit of rivalry. But yeah, we it. finally saw an England side that looked like the World Cup England side that we saw. I will say Russo was player of the match for me. She be un, you know, doesn't get the same flowers as everybody usually gets, but I think her hold up play was stellar. She broke up play. Her defensive work was great. Um, Honestly, Renard wasn't able to do much anytime she was on the ball. She just broke lines. She let everybody catch up to her. Her possession was really good. As a nine, it's really hard because everyone's either running by you or trying to stay in front of you, but then there's defenders catching up. I thought she handled it really, really well. It's fun to see her game mm -hmm. develop. I think we've seen a new phase of Russo. In Absolutely, and especially since like that that sort of rivalry, competitive rivalry mm -hmm. between her and Daly kind of fell off. It's like she secured her spot yeah. on the England squad, but also she's played two matches back to back, full matches. Mm -hmm. On top of that, traveled from Australia for the friendlies right before this. So it's and she like, still makes it look pretty easy. Right? Yeah. She? <laughs> she's a superhero. Yeah. It's exactly. insane. England get this win 2 1 over France, their first win at France since 1973. You could say revenge was on the mind for the Lionesses. In this group with France, England, and Sweden, Ireland is already out. They can no longer win it. Um, who gets through? Who is the top two spots in this group at the end of the day? Kubo, England. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> You're both like, nope, you hopped in, hopped in for seat. Go ahead, Kubo, Kubo is through. I mean, I would love to see like England, France, but I, I, I think it's gonna be, I think England will squeak through. Um, I don't know, Darian, you go. I also agree. I think it'll be France, England. <laughs> France, England. Yeah. I like it. I mean, it's the tightest competition point wise of all the groups, just two points separating mm -hmm. one through three in this group A3. Let's take a look at group A4 and these standings. Germany, they get the win 3 1 over Poland, undefeated through four. Germany has already qualified for the Euros. Iceland, they get their first qualifying win 2 1 over Austria to claim second in this group with seven points. Um, Poland and Germany, though, 
this was a, a tough opening 15 minutes for Germany. They go down 1-0 to Poland, and then in the second half, a rejuvenation from Germany. Three second half goals to get the job done, and Germany extends their five-game winning streak. But this was their third come-from-behind win in four match days. What is happening at the start of matches, Darian, for Germany? They just look that they're not prepared for the pressure that's going to come. I think they're maybe trying to find their way into a game, seeing the tactics of the opponent. But in matches like this, you need to come out swinging. And everybody knows how Germany plays. This is a star-studded team. They've had so much success. So teams are going to come out on their front foot trying to exploit. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Germany's been prepared for it. Like I said before, it takes until the second half for them to kind of find their way into the match. Luckily, they did. You have goals from Gwyn, Schuler. Um, it was a good comeback for them, but you don't, they need to know you can't always have to, you don't have to make games this difficult to come back from. Do you think they've just underestimated the competition and they're kind of feeling out what they're capable of and then finally turning on or what? Maybe overestimated themselves mm -hmm. of handling how teams are going to come out. Victim of opinion. ego a little bit? A little bit. Fair. Germany has already qualified through to the Euros for Poland. The highest that they can place in this group is third, but between Iceland and Austria, who gets through along with Germany? Iceland. Yeah, I think they're, they're scrappy. Yeah, they're fun. They're fun to watch. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Um, Iceland, they play Germany, so it'll be tough to see in that first match day. All right, that was our Euros qualifiers. Spain, Switzerland, and Germany have already qualified for 2025 women's Euros. Don't go anywhere, though. Sandra Herrera joins us next to talk NWSL. Welcome back to Attacking Third. Saturday night under the lights takes on a new meaning this weekend in match day 12 in the NWSL as Chicago Red Stars hosts Bay FC at the iconic Wrigley Field in Chicago. And for more on this, we welcome in our good friend Sandra Herrera. Sandra, welcome in. How are you? Hey, how's it going, gang? I'm, I'm doing all right. I'm, I'm still out here in uh, Minnesota, but happy to chat all things Red Stars with you. Well, thanks for taking some time and joining us because this is an iconic match coming up on Saturday between Chicago and Bay. But put it into perspective for us. As a Chicagoan, what does it mean for this club to be playing at Wrigley Field? It's pretty massive. I think there's been a lot of buzz and excitement around this ever since the franchise announced that they were going to reschedule their fixture against Bay FC to go and play at iconic Wrigley Field. And ever since then, there's just been a major push around this particular match. They're really treating it as a very special event. They're, I think, kind of holding out on the final announcement in terms of actual tickets sold because that number kind of keeps rising from, from day to day since they put those uh, tickets on sale just a few weeks ago. So I think there's a real uh, emphasis here on making sure that this is a successful event because it's becoming a bit of what could possibly be a benchmark for potential future one-offs like this in the league. Sandra, I know it's so important that the ownership got approval from the NWSL to play at a baseball stadium. Now, I was a player when the CBA was written, and I played on two baseball fields on two separate teams for entire seasons. How did they get approval from the NWSL to get this done? Yeah, I think it was, it was a pretty much a, co a collaborative effort. There was no way an event like this was going to happen without, uh, you know, dialogue between both clubs and not just the clubs, but really the player reps for the NWSL Players Association as well. So I think there's a, there's a push, right? I think we can all agree that we have found ourselves speaking about uh, women's sports in general, but in our case, women's soccer and kind of this uh, rise to prominence in terms of interest and and hopefully how that leads to future investment. And I think when it comes to putting off special events like this, it's really exciting. But we're just in about two years into this collective bargaining agreement with the with between the league and the players association. And within that, it says that there has to be those minimum standards that are met when it comes to playing surface. So it's important that, you know, Darian, that yeah, once upon a time, there were a couple uh, baseball fields that were considered the home grounds for some former teams and not just baseball fields. We're talking kind of second division or minor league mm -hmm. fields. And I think that's where some of the kind of triggers come into effect. We're just like, Oh no, what is this going to mean? But we're talking about a major, 
League Baseball facility. Yes, it is one of the second oldest facilities across uh, Major League Baseball, but also has been a home to one-off events in the past. They're not unfamiliar with hosting um, you know, collegiate football games and things like that, hockey matches as well. So I know folks are going to be looking at how the you know the layout is going to be for that, but it wasn't going to happen uh, without some sort of, of blessing or approval from uh, players, reps uh, from both sides of the team here. Sandra, just to piggyback off that, um, Wrigley, obviously baseball stadium, but more importantly, a massive Chicago landmark. Was it a priority for the Red Stars ownership group or the new ownership to get a game there for that reason? Or what do you think the priorities were there? I think a lot of what we've heard out of this new ownership group and club president Karen Lisa is about how they want to make sure that this club gets back to prominence, but they're trying to do that with patience, even if some of them may be uh, a little bit impatient with kind of the results that they want to see. But this is just essentially kind of year zero or year one where this new ownership group and this influx of money and investment is coming in for this Red Stars franchise. So it wasn't exactly like, hey, we have some um, connections here with the Ricketts family. Let's make sure that we get a Red Stars game in Wrigley. I think there's almost a little bit of a layer of pleasant surprise that this sort of one-off event is happening so quickly. But I don't think that that's going to be kind of the end for the Red Stars. I think this is going to be a bit of a measuring stick, not just for them, but for the league as well. Because I think what we're starting to see is some of that, that buzz and, and excitement that comes with kind of having – a soccer game, maybe in a non-traditional setting. So I think this is something that we've seen with other sports leagues as well, where there's crossovers for different leagues to kind of showcase and get in front of new eyeballs. And I think maybe there's that little bit of surprise that they're generating this much budget and excitement so early in this sort of first season with new ownership. But I won't be surprised that this kind of maybe sets a metric for future things, not just for Chicago Red Stars or the, or, or the league as well. Sandra, let's talk a little bit about the football itself, because between Chicago and Bay, I mean, this is a good matchup. Um, what is your takeaway on this match? What are some tactics that Chicago you want to see from them in order to get this win in this historic match? Yeah, I think I think that's going to also be a little bit of what's on folks' mind. How, not how is how this event going to go off in, in Wrigley Field, but how is it going to look between Bay FC and Chicago Red Stars? We, we've seen Chicago kind of uh, present that typical Lauren Donaldson style with a, a sort of a, an emphasis on the defensive structure and shape, maybe kind of playing some triggers about who's going to go ahead and get on the end of those, those potential long balls in front of the goal and sort of score. And then Bay FC, they've kind of shown us a little bit of a mixed bag themselves. They, over these last few weeks, they have shown that they themselves can also be a pretty defensive-minded, sounded type of team. They kind of held that we saw them hold Orlando to a narrow scoreline. You know, they're not any strangers to, to doing that themselves. So I hope maybe the general excitement of this game will open things up a little bit. There are some exciting attackers on both ends of, uh, of the pitch here for between both teams. So I'm, I'm hopeful that maybe we get a little bit of a shootout in this one. I also hope it's going to be a shootout, Sandra, but... With two national team players coming back, Sam Staub, Mal Swanson back into the squad with this historic venue. Sam Staub getting her first cap, first full 90 with the U.S. Women's National Team. How warm of a welcome do you think this is going to be for these players? I think it's going to be massive, you know, and I think that's something to know going into this game, that some of the players who might be a bit informed coming off of the international break where there was a pause in some, some club soccer, that Mallory Swanson and Sam Staub are going to be two players who are primed and ready to go. But I would also argue that maybe there's going to be a little bit of a spotlight on that goalkeeper uh, position as well for Chicago Red Stars. Alyssa Nayer has been navigating and kind of working her way back from a, a thigh injury, but uh, she has said on, on record in the buildup to this game that she's targeting this game. She wants to play in this type of special historical moment for the club. So we'll see if she's ready to go on Saturday. Saturday night under the lights of Wrigley Field, Chicago Red Stars against Bay FC. Sandra, thanks so much for joining us and previewing it. Appreciate it. Have a great one, y'all. Thanks, bud. All right, don't go anywhere. Plenty more attacking third because we are talking NWSL and looking ahead at all the matches this weekend.
Welcome back to Attacking Third. NWSL action is back this weekend. Um, and happy Pride Month. A lot of these clubs celebrating their Pride Nights, including Racing Louisville as they host Houston Dash Friday at 8 p.m. And then San Diego Wave take on Orlando Pride. Saturday, a huge game on CBS with Gotham FC hosting Angel City. It's also Pride Night at Red Bull Arena. Saturday night, Chicago Red Stars take on Bay FC at Wrigley Field. And then Utah Royals hosting Washington Spirit. Portland Thorn against North Carolina Courage. And on Sunday, a lone match between Kansas City Current and Seattle Reign. A couple of teams, Orlando Pride and Kansas City, still at the top of the table, undefeated through these first 10 slash 11 match days. Ooh. A couple teams on different points. Let's talk Gotham FC versus Angel City. Saturday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern time. It's the first meeting between these two sides. Gotham, a, a team that is unbeaten in six matches. They are on an incredible run right now. Darian, when you look at New Jersey, New York, Gotham FC under Juan Carlos Amaros after an international break, there's a lot of factors. What do you hope this team worked on in the break? <laughs> Give Ella Stevens and Esther the ball. <laughs> Let Lynn Williams cook. I, you know, they have a lot of superstars still with this squad. I hope that they've been working on just finishing more opportunities. Um, they create so many chances. So many, it's almost nauseating, but not scoring a ton of goals. Uh, I want to see a game where they're putting three, four away. This may be the chance to do it. All of these players coming back from international break. This team left on a really, really good note. And Ella freaking Stevens. Lisa, I think you said she was your player of the month, right? She was one of my players of the month. Yeah, four goals in their last three matches. Yeah, it just she took her a little bit of time to get going. Now she's... Well, I'm fastest sure. brace in the league this Amazing. season. Okay. She had to fit in with this really stacked squad and kind of find her way where she gels the best, where she's connecting the best, where she's looking the most dangerous. So I think Gotham on their end just needs to work on finishing those opportunities because they're going to get them. Angel City's been struggling this season, two game losing streak. Most of their attack comes through Thompson and Emsley. Yes, LaRue, dangerous in the 18, but if she's not getting service, mm -hmm. what can you do? Um, I hope we see, you know, kind of a, I don't know, high attacking game. Yeah. I think I that mean. would be really fun, especially since Angel City have conceded 16 goals already this season. This would be the game to sort of jack up that goal differential for Gotham mm -hmm. and keep some pep in their step, um, get some more goals for Ella. Uh, Alyssa Thompson does like to score against Gotham, mm -hmm. though, I will say. Player to watch for Angel City, who needs to step up and, and have a good match from Becky uh, Tweed's side? Uh, I think we'll see probably another Claire Emsley mm -hmm. performance. She's oh, right yeah. now their high school scorer. She's got five for them, which I did not expect, quite frankly. But okay, like I'm all aboard. A lot of the, what happens with Angel City is they, they get the ball to Claire Emsley, whether it's mm -hmm. wide, getting in behind. Sometimes she tucks into the pocket. She's also coming off a great international yeah. break with yes. Scotland. I believe she had a brace mm -hmm. in their last match. So shout out Claire Emsley. That match got them against Angel City on Saturday. We have some other matches to get through, though, because Kansas City is taking on Seattle Rain. Kansas City is undefeated through all of these matches. However, in their last couple, they've only picked up two wins in their last five. And Seattle, they're on a three-game skid. Christine, what are you watching for? I'm watching for Kansas City to continue to win and score more goals. I, I don't, whatever's going on at the rain, it's, it hasn't changed. They don't seem to be kind of gelling yet as a squad, and I don't know what's happening over there, but Kansas City are undeterred. Mm -hmm. They just, I mean, their top three are just really fun to watch. It's a good squad. They're really fluid. Bia, um, Bia. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> plays in my head always. I so appreciate uh, you just for that show. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bia, back healthy. Hopefully see her get more and more minutes. Um, she got to rest this international break, hopefully build up her fitness. Looks confident, looks comfortable. Uh, I think that's what's been the not issue with Kansas City, but maybe why they haven't looked so threatening is her connection with Chawinga. They're two totally different types of footballers, but complement each other really well. They ask a lot of defenses that they play against with um, one of them stretching, one of them checking, both of their technical ability, um, the way that they combine, the way they see the game. Davinia back in form. She just scored a goal with Brazil. Very this unselfish. Is a, yeah, this is a dangerous attack for Kansas City. I don't know many teams that when they're all healthy can actually shut down all three of them so they're not able to play make. And even if they do, mm -hmm. Lola Bonta, Vanessa Bernardo, they have so many players that can score. Um, but it's going to be tough for Seattle. I, I hope maybe in this break they got some new energy, they worked on some tactics that are going to suit them a little bit more because Kansas City is susceptible to getting scored on. They are really good in the mm -hmm. air. 
Um, but it, it's going to be tough to come out with a win in this this match for me for Seattle. It's a tale of different rosters, hands down. Kansas City has depth coming off the bench. They have multiple players that come in late in matches that could be starters and act like starters once they get in. Meanwhile, for Seattle, it's they don't have that much depth, and it, it is a little thin once it comes to after the starting players hit that 60-minute mark, 70-minute mark. So international break, I hope Laura Harvey gave them some time off, right? Mm -hmm. A little bit of rest, recover. Let's focus on watching film and tactics about how you can try to keep Kansas City out from their goal mouth, right, because they find ways to score in every single match Kansas City is in. Meanwhile, another team that – always finds ways to score <laughs> Orlando Pride. Eight straight wins. They've set a record. They're hoping to increase that this weekend again as Orlando Pride travels to Snapdragon Stadium to take on San Diego Wave. It's been the Barbara Banda show all season since she came to Orlando. Uh, is there a way for San Diego to stop Banda and Orlando? If you can predict where she'll be and where the ball will be, yes, you have a 100% chance of maybe getting an opportunity to stop her and then probably not stop her anyway. Potentially. Chance of maybe. Potentially. <laughs> maybe. There's a potential chance of maybe. But without that, like, you can try smothering her and it's still, she will shake you and then you'll be embarrassed. Duly embarrassed and then probably get scored on nevertheless. She's just so good. If there's a defensive duo... That can slow down Barbara Banda, Darian. Is it one at San Diego with Kaylin Sheridan goal, Naomi Gurma in the center back position? Is this it? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think there's as much as I'd love to really say, yes. name that can slow down Barbara Banda if she's given the ball in areas of space. I think if you try to double team her, you alleviate any sort of passes that can go to her. Yes, but she flicks people off of her. It, she makes it look so easy. A lot of these goals, too, we see of Banda is like really poor marking the box. You can't give her a lot of space. But in my opinion, she's impossible to stop. I hope San Diego can score some goals because I think it's inevitable at this rate that Barbara Banda is not mm -hmm. going to score. But San Diego coming back, Alex Morgan, Jaden Shaw, Gurma, they have a lot of star power. We saw them kind of getting it back, that gel, that run of play that they have where they can break teams down. Um, playing to player strengths a little bit more right before the break. I hope we see them build on it because I do think Orlando is still a little vulnerable in the back. There are opportunities to exploit them on transitions in particular, um, but I still think it's going to be the Banda show. Yeah. I was waiting for your rep to come back I, out. Like, listen, I'm, I'm I, saving I kinda, it. I felt it kind of coming. I don't <laughs> I know. Like, I was like, reserve yourself. <laughs> Have some dignity today. I don't know. We'll consider it for later. For this San Diego side under Casey Stoney, it's been a bit of an up and down season. In their Very. last three matches, they haven't been able to pick up a win, just two points off two draws. And it's because of a lot of rotation, a lot of changes, playing and putting pressure on personnel, and even certain individuals from San Diego saying, hey, it's on me, it's on us mm -hmm. individually to do that. Do you expect to see a lot of rotation from San Diego in this match against Orlando? I do expect to see some rotation. Uh, Casey Stoney has been very open to the fact that if you're not performing, if you're not showing up, if I've given you a chance, you're not going to start. We have younger players who are happy to come in and just get minutes at this point, and I want to build them up. So I do think we'll see some rotation, especially rewarding players that mm -hmm. haven't been on an international break, that have been training really well. Um, so I do expect that. And what a fun way to go out and play against an Orlando side and really yeah. get some experience under mm -hmm. your belt against a team that's playing phenomenally at the moment. Um, and it'll just give them confidence going forward. So I do expect a lot of rotation for Casey Stoney's side. With San Diego, they had players that I think just needed time together. At least yeah. Bennett, Maria Sanchez coming in um, with McCaskill also trying to find her footing in this midfield. Hopefully this international break was a chance for San Diego to work on some and of that. And have some fun. Exactly. Always for sure. Enjoy the game again. We're always looking to have fun. Uh, <laughs> NWSL is back this weekend. We are so excited about it. And NWSL is back on CBS with Gotham FC taking on Angel City. We will have a special attacking third Saturday starting at 12 noon as a pregame for Gotham Angel City on Galazzo Network. Thanks so much for joining us for today for Attacking Third, brought to you by PNC Brank. Brilliantly boring since 1865. Have a great weekend.